Welcome everyone to a brand new Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. This week, we are going to be talking about August's recommended record. By Brainiac, is called Hissing Prigs in Static Couture. Um, and as, as for the reason I wanted to show you this, it should become understandable with the context of this album. Brainiac were a Dayton, Ohio band originally formed in 1992, fronted by Tim Taylor and Tim, this... Tim the Toe Man Taylor. Yeah, that one. Oh no. And uh... this band... <laughs> this band over their five... Over their short five-year career, went on to build up quite the profile, opening for shows on tours for like Beck, The Breeders, and The Jesus Lizard. Eventually, Jesus. Kind, kind of building up their profile slowly and slowly, eventually to the point where they were receiving major label offers. Uh, their first two albums being released on the label Brass, uh, Grass BMG, and this album actually coming out on Touch and Go. And what is significant about this album is that after this, they were signed to Interscope Records, a very prominent American oh, record label. Yeah. Who very, has very big you know, artists we like? You know, what, what some 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 minor talents like uh, Kendrick Lamar, Billy Eilish, uh, you know, little um, little never obscure, heard of them. little obscure artists. But they were signed to this label in 1997, and this was going to be the zenith of their cultural relevance. This was going to be their moment. And then Tim Taylor dies in a car crash. Jesus and, Christ. And effectively, the group is immediately kind of split up and scattered to the wind because of this sudden and tragic death. And I mean, I think the reason why Tim Taylor was irreplaceable is very apparent on this album and was also reflected in their live performances. Um, but that's, that's really the context. But what's important about why I wanted to talk about this specifically is A, uh, their final album, this one, Hissing Prigs and Static Couture, had a great influence on plenty of bands we like, like uh, The Breeders, Guided by Voices, the Mars Volta at the Drive-In all ended up taking elements from their sound and incorporating them into later records in their career. Uh, Tim Taylor's a fascinating writer and front man, which is another good reason. And really, the main reason is this album is fucking weird. And <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's why I wanted to talk about it more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. so I've had a lot of fun um, getting to know this album uh, the last few mm -hmm. days. Um, uh, yeah, it is very weird um, and it is very uh, idiosyncratic. And their, the highly idiosyncratic approach of Brainiac um, to their particular brand of Twisted, um, you could debate genre labels. I think the best way of describing it is kind of art punk. I think it's more art punk than noise rock, even though there's absolutely elements of, of noise rock in it as well. But anyway, regardless, it is an exciting amalgam of sounds that fuse the avant-garde sensibilities of late 70s, early 80s bands like This Heat and other bands in the no wave scene with also the kind of alt psych fringes of 90s alternative rock uh, bands like The Flaming Lips. In fact, if I were to force a comparison between this and anything else, uh, which doesn't feel appropriate, but still, if I were to do that, it would be the lips, specifically in their early 90s era, the era that preceded Brainiac with records like Priest Driven Ambulance, for instance. Um, but what Brainiac do, even in the context of this time, is so utterly singular and abrasively distinct that it kind of defies description in a certain way, which again is why I commend August for recommending it, because it's certainly going to give us 
um, an interesting challenge. And I can also see why August recommended it as well in terms of being not only a record that is somewhat below the radar, and especially not getting the attention that it would undeniably have if Brainiac were to go on and have a successful major label career, um, but also in just being so unabashedly uh, of its own ilk that and, and, and drawing from so many uh, influences and points of reference that are standard and praise the high heavens and I'll get into a lot of them but um, also just being able to do the rare thing of, of bringing in uh, elements from that scene and completely uh, twisting the ways in which they're presented into this new malformed thing that is so uh, you know rich and just uh, an absolute pleasure to listen to in terms of its sheer originality in that sense um, mm -hmm. Vincent Come On Down is a great punk rager track um, that in its basic elements fits really neatly into the particular scene that is started by bands like Sonic Youth, for instance. But then it also uh, adds these surreal electronic elements that weave through it and complicate that. And that's a great um, um, you know, example of, of a core example of, of what Brainiac do on this record. Uh, the vocal effects uh, that, that they frequently, that Tim Taylor frequently uses on this album are perhaps the most instantly memorable element of the record. And they give this delightful effect that is very disarming is the first time you encounter it, but um, is so utterly unique and, and so in keeping with the irreverent strangeness of the way everything else is orchestrated and that it anchors that and also, um, you know, transcends it in a way to it it's the, it sounds almost as though it gives the effect of a of a fried performer who is delivering all of his vocals while being electrocuted uh it's so strange and in such a uh, a way that i found you know immediately uh, endearing and gripping yeah i uh, to touch on some of the vocal effects and i think the really creative way they're used uh, the track This Little Piggy notably uses a spell and speak during the verses to double what uh, the lines Tim is delivering, and it creates this really disorienting sound, especially when uh, during that first verse when the two are panning between channels and you're just absolutely lost. You're like, what the hell am I even listening to? Uh, and, and then the way that spell and speak drops out for the chorus of you can't win adds just a great kick of gusto and just sweeps you right up in this album. I think mm. that that just the immediacy of the performances is one of the best things on here, as you've said. Yeah, and I, and I completely agree that This Little Piggy is an, a, an absolute standout on this record, one of the best um, and most fully formed tracks here. Uh, it is, and it's easy to get swept up in the carefully organized chaos of this record at first, and I will concede that the first time I heard it, that is just what happened. I could barely make heads or tails of it, really. I was just letting it wash over me. Um, but it's easy to forget, and I'm sure August will touch on this as well, that this is a fundamentally talented band where each member's contributions are smart, memorable, and intricate. Uh, and I think This Little Piggy is a, is a great standout in the sense that it's a great display of everyone's talents. And is also, I think, ironically considering some of those effects and some of the stuff that August has touched on, one of the most uh, accessible and even close to conventional tracks on this record despite it being loaded with those weird effects and also weird chord choices as well and all sorts of strangeness. Uh, in many ways, this track reminded me of early Unwound, uh, except much more self-consciously weird and, um, you know, again, idiosyncratic. And I love that aspect of it so much. This track is fun as shit, man. Like, um, I'm, I'm very used to, like, getting, like... A record on record club that like I don't know jack shit about the look it up on Spotify on Spotify or whatever wherever and the tracks have have like letters substituting the vowels and I'm like oh fucking god what am I in for but then letter, like letter, letters substituting the vowels <laughs> oh no then I listen substituting to substituting my bowels 
Hey <laughs> Num- <laughs> numbers. Substituting. How do they work? <laughs> but then I. <laughs> then I listened to it. Um, and it's like half an hour long. It's raucous and fun and like very almost like kind of like Sonic Youthy and kind of how like just noisy and fun it is and how loud it can be. Loved it. Great, great pick, man. I had a great time. Yeah. I uh, one member I do want to highlight the contributions of is uh, drummer Tyler Trent, who I think really brings such a great groove to this album he brings such a ferocity to his drum performances and that's really highlighted on the track nothing ever changes which has a very which his drums become the forefront of that song admittedly it's probably because steve albini himself produces this song yeah and oh it's the one song on the album he produces but it's an interesting moment because it really lets you hone in on the talent of, of one particular member here. Mm. And, it's, and it's admittedly easy to get lost, yeah, in just the raucousness and nonsense of it to not, and like kind of not really get the the sheer talent each individual member has as tyler has mentioned because like the the guitarists on here uh are quite good too they have really hooky compelling guitar licks throughout like i love a lot of the ways the guitars duel and build up to choruses or just go nuts during tracks like uh kiss me you jacked up jerk which that song is in its own league of like is there even a structure here and it's it's in the moments when they're getting so abrasive and furthest away from structure from like just a conventional structure where i think you can really see like the individual instrumental performers shine because that's when they really have the most room to experiment without uh tim taylor's voice kind of taking up uh taking your attention um yeah i i'm kind of a two of two minds about that particular aspect of the record um, especially because um, I'm so drawn in the first half of the record to how well constructed the songs are, in a sense, how um, memorable and uh, artfully put together uh, the songs, uh, particularly on the first half of this record, are like particularly Pussyfoot and Vincent Come On Down, This Little Piggy, Hot Seat Can't Sit Down, which is another um, track I love. Uh, that track specifically. Um, was a moment on the record when I became aware of the clear influence of the Pixies. Uh, oh, yeah. Both the dreamy but rolling slacker vocals and, of course, the absurd places that the vocals go to. Um, there's, like, a really funny, like, falsetto part on the song, I think, that was, like, totally unexpected. Um, and also the rumbling bass as well, the generally ramshackle but also melodic arrangements that rely heavily on contrasting dynamics between the gentle and the chaotic um, something that also reappears on other tracks like um, Nothing Ever Changes, for instance. And uh, um, Pussyfoot, and I think being yes. another one that's very clearly. A- um, absolutely. Uh, and so that aspect of the, those songs, particularly in the first half of the record, I really respond to. It really feels like the band have taken their core sound and their idea of, of the sonic mayhem or, or of exploring unconventional textures and ways of um, performing because they're tethered into really catchy and strong songs. And I respond less to some of the more um, truly out there and structurally freeform tracks in the second half of the record, like particularly the run from um, Beekeepers Maxim to 7KG Man are three interesting tracks that have really interesting components. Um, There are definitely aspects of those songs that I like a lot. I love, for instance, in um, Kiss Me You Jacked Up Jerk, there's a real amusing contrast between the loping, tense bass line of the song and the absurd vocal deliveries. 
uh, really entertaining elements, but I don't feel that they build into anything bigger. Um, and that's ultimately where parts of this record like this kind of um, don't connect fully as well as other parts of the record because it feels as though they, in getting away from that core structure and that core songwriting uh, con construction, it kind of uh, feels a little uneven in certain aspects. It's not a big detraction from the record, but it is something that I start to feel um, more prominently when I listen to this record more and more. Um, while definitely the first few times you hear it, those aspects um, of those songs are really fun to kind of gawk at and as curio aspects. Uh, I respond most strongly to the elements of this record where they are applied to something more substantive. Uh, and that said, uh, I do think this record finishes really strongly. Um, Nothing Ever Changes has already been talked about. I love that. Again, I'd like right to bring up the drummer on this record because there's a real versatility in the way he performs. I love the marching rhythm that he adopts, like almost a quasi marching rhythm he adopts on this track. And the anxious, jittery guitar parts in the verses are great too. Uh, my favorite song on the record personally is the closing track, I Am a Cracked Machine which is maybe the most uh, confronting and kind of raucous thing here. Uh, it has this distorted screamed chorus that's actually been stuck in my head for the last couple of days. And this really great uh, noisy breakdown, those loud, quiet dynamics are here again. But there's also this snotty energy that's pure punk in this song that I really respond to a lot as well. Um, and the, yeah, and it, it only really makes me feel uh, even more sad about the tragedy of Tim Taylor's loss because it feels like to me this band's next record would have probably been the one especially being a major label debut would have probably been the one that refines some of the rougher edges of this and and really fully connects to me as a great album but that all aside I found this record thoroughly enjoyable it is a brisk um, record it packs a lot of punch into its 34 minutes um, some of the more uh, weirder interlude moments as well that I was afraid would fall flat for me I actually found quite interesting uh, particularly the song Strung which uh, is I kind of hate it but I also kind of love it it has this um, looped stock scream sound that's played mm. over and over and over and, and that kind of is really grating but also kind of like uh, you know disconcerting but also like there's this rumbling bass part on the yeah that that, I love it's so I like love that song thick that. sounding and there's also this harmonic guitar line that glimmers uh, in the part of this track as well alongside this whispered vocal and the way that these disparate sounds come together in this shorter track I find quite uh, you know uh, uh, really nice uh, ultimately even despite it being um, perhaps a less substantive track and, and I like that element of, of the experimentation there uh, in particular but yeah overall uh, so much to enjoy here so much to um, dig into and, and, and it's a really fun record to just listen to and, and mm. try and figure out how you're going to describe what you're hearing <laughs> yeah Yeah, I'll say that the album, or really the artist, really, uh, that this album reminded me the most of uh, is none un other than the Dillinger Escape Plan. Uh, Glad you made that comp. I was going to make it too. Uh, particularly in bo both Calculating Infinity and, and Dissociation to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely sort of manic untamed really out there material from that band even ireworks to some degree um and as such i enjoyed this album a lot um not i mean you know not as much as i enjoy every dillinger record but you know that's his second favorite band uh that's, you know that's most music Morgan, yeah. that's yeah, the great the great majority of it. I mean, um, just just the comp from you is enough to to sell your enjoyment. I think. Yeah, yeah, it's probably. Yeah, true. I, I hadn't even thought of it, but now you're saying that this has exactly the same energy as Calculating Infinity, uh -huh. just in terms of the the rear the, the, the raw weird of confronting weirdness of it. 
Yeah, it just it feels like uh, Brainiac used the approach that Dillinger used on that the approach to that album, and that is just sort of taking traditional music theory and breaking every rule that they could think of to just disorient you as much as possible while also remembering to fucking go. Um, so yeah, anything that can do that without being so abrasive and kind of, you know, without, uh, frankly, any anything that can do that without sucking means it's pretty great. Um, because they're all like, by nature, there are so many ways that an approach like that could go wrong and just make for bad, uninteresting music. Trout mass replica. Um, so, you know, anything that really succeeds is pretty, uh, you know, immense as an achievement. Um, and, you know, that even puts aside how much fun this album is. I don't have yeah. super detailed thoughts because it hits me so viscerally uh, for mm. so much of its runtime. But as a as a sort of shot of adrenaline and as a sort of vivid experience of bizarre but consistently compelling music, uh, liked it a whole lot. Just, um, I could be talking out my ass here, but like to me, another thing that reminds me of Calculating Infinity or like a shared comparison, those records have, even though they sound, you know, they're completely different genres of music, but like both of those records have like, and maybe this is more subtextual uh, in the case of this record, but, or maybe it's just like the way that the performance, what the performances of the vocalists make me think of, but like there's like a kind of sexual frustration um, to both of those records, like a kind of like pent up, um like like you're full of this kind of like you need to explode and it's got this kind of like weirdly um repressed and just just horny yeah horny energy i guess is is just as good a way of saying it both of those records have that and that's part of like what's so i guess appealing about listening to the performers is they just have this really like bizarro energy that's like so imbued in that Just, just running around screaming why doesn't anyone want to fuck me in musical form. Mm. yeah uh no i think i think you're definitely onto something there tyler in that i think a lot of that's a lot of the thematic core of this record is that pent up is just that pent up like rage or even just like this urge to just throw away everything which every card you've been dealt in your life the urge to just throw it all away and go crazy and just break down and do whatever you want and and that's i think a bit more front and center in some of the more uh punk leaning more uh explicitly punk leaning songs like vincent come on down uh but yeah i think it's also communicated in a lot of subtler ways throughout this uh in just a lot of the yeah that frustration that yeah frustration is the way i'd put it is really a kind of a shadow that hangs over this record in a really interesting weird kind of ephemeral way and just touch briefly on the title of this record, which um, is just a beautiful set of sounds, regardless of what it, what you whether you investigate the main, meaning or not. But I, I didn't know what half of the words in the title meant, and I just looked it up. And so, a prig is a person is a is a a um, sort of informal term for a person who is like excessively conformist, but in a really mm-hmm. ar- arrogant or smug way. And couture is a word for like highly the, the creation of like highly fashionable clothing. Yes. So the 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 image the title um, evokes is like this uh, buzzing like uppity person who is like presenting themselves in a very kind of like plastic way uh, and radiating a kind of like poisonous energy basically like a, or like a venomous energy like a snake for instance, and that 
I don't necessarily know what that means. I haven't really investigated the lyrical aspects of this record, but it, it provides a very vivid image of something that is, uh, you know, quite disarming. Oh yeah, and I think I think this album is in a way trying to, and I I'm I've not I've listened to this for like I've had this in my life for like over a year now. And I, I've never been able to quite make heads or tails of if the album is describing a rejection of that person the title is evoking or it is emblematic of the person that is evoking because, yeah, a lot of the lyricism is very esoteric and mm. I... You could all you could say meaningless. I don't think it's necessarily meaningless because I think, and this is where I'd draw the at the drive-in comparison. I think it's very densely packed, and using a lot of metaphors to get across concepts that are a lot more simple than that are simpler than like they're being presented mm. to you. Yeah, and the at the, at the driving comp like really shines there because it's like this is just this writing style and that ti the title of this record is emblematic of that. It's a very esoteric way of describing a kind of like giving a potency and a real visual sharpness to a particular concept, to a particular idea of someone who is presenting themselves in a certain way where they want to be perceived as, um, you know, uh, normal, ordinary, like uh, fashionable, like part of the. Um, you know conforming but as a result they're they are appearing in, in this kind of blank static uh ugly way as a result of that and and like that that's a very similar way of expressing an, the idea of like non -con of conformity or of distance from the norm that you know cedric bixler zavala would write about other topics in a sort of similar with a sort of similar approach right um, so yeah, and and also like combined with the sound of this record that very clearly echoes a lot of like punk influenced roots as well, and a lot of the instrumentation like specifically on the last track and other points in this record as well. Yeah, it does feel like of a piece of certain elements of the punk scene, but infused into this very self consciously weird uh, and nerdy and like strange uh, subculture of it that was coming to the fore in the nineties. Yeah, this album's really fascinating for multiple reasons. Um, I found myself a little frustrated with it, honestly. Um, I feel like for all the reasons, I, I'm glad that Tyler and Morgan mentioned this, is um, it actually does remind me a lot of the Dillinger Escape Plan, but very specifically Ironworks in that it's an album that it's constantly taking risks it's an album that's constantly just like you know as tyler said on our main episode today is fucking they, they be putting their whole pussy into this and like uh that i respect and admire but there are always moments about it that just hold it back on a strangely integral level i think uh Firstly, I'm not really a fan of when the album kind of slows down on songs like Stung or The Vulgar Trade. It, it's just a lot of sound play on, you know, a 35 minute album that I just don't really get along with, I guess. I, when I'm listening to them, I don't necessarily like, I don't have any bad feelings on them. It's just that I would want this to be a little bit more like, just front to back, just go, 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 go. And it paces itself. And I'm sure you could probably argue that that's a beneficial trait for it being more holistic. But when I look for music like this, I look for people pushing extremes. And I guess that's sort of what leads me to have like a bit of a distance with this. Um, like a perfect microcosm is that Tyler mentioned those stock sound effects that have that kind of layer over them perfect example of what I'm talking about here is that oh man I can't fucking stand that shit everybody knows my biggest fucking pet peeve with movies is stock sound effects because I hear them and I'm instantly taken out of it and whenever that happens in music which unfortunately it happens a fucking lot 
uh, they'll just sample like doors opening sound effects, and I'm just like, I have that on my fuck on iMovie. Could you have just could you just like mic the door like just one time, one time, just do this? It's just, it's just stock, it's so stock, it's stock. It's yeah, stock. but like th- th- those little like that little moment is just like that'll happen, and I'll just be like, ah, it doesn't ruin the song, but it just it holds it back in a, a way that's like you know this is an easy thing to consume. It's still energetic. It's still brisk, it's still fun, but I also think I find myself like. I was definitely really also reminded of at the drive-in. This kind of sounded like the like lost middle point. Actually, I, I think it would be better to like make a triangle at which at this record lies the circle. And it's D Loust, um, in Casino Out, and uh Relationship of Command. All between those three albums is this. And in that I have the same problem with this album that I that Morgan has with Deloused and the Comatorium, is that I feel like it's 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 almost there. It's it's it, it has a lot going on and a lot of it works, but I just want I, I wanted it to swing for the fences a little bit more. And I feel like if this band had gotten the chance, if you know their frontman didn't tragically die that like Tyler this their next album would have been their relationship of command and it's a damn shame but like I can totally see the influence that this album has on several records that I really really like um and it is a damn shame and I do like it it's just one of the very few instances where something like this which I would assume would be a slam dunk for me it's just it's a little eh, it's a bit it's a bit further away from the stuff I usually like out of this but I totally get it um, yeah, on the note of at the drive-in, um, I would also say perhaps the, the the point, the thing in terms of that that I'm reminded of the most is Acrobatic Tenement, their first record, which yeah. is obviously yeah. a very different sounding record to this, but has a kind of similarly kind of unkempt, um, scrappy energy to it. And I, th- I mm-hmm. think this is a much better record than that one. And um, but came out the same year, interestingly. Yeah. Huh. So it's like oh. these kind of where this is maybe a congealing scene that was happening at this particular time. And so I fully believe that the next Brainiac record would have been, you know, something between an Inconsino out and a relationship of command. Certainly the potential was there. Um, but also at the same time, even though Acrobatic Tenement is may, probably my least favorite record that the members of Act the Drive-In have been involved in, uh, it still has like a lot of its own charms. And in terms of that scrappiness, in terms of that the sheer ambition that's on display there before they would fully realize how to communicate it musically. Uh, yeah. And I think that is something that's shared by this record as well. And this record happens to benefit by, in addition to that, also having, having at least four or five really great, solidly, fantastically constructed songs on it. Uh, and that ultimately is why I am on board with this record, despite my reservations. Yeah, and I, I think the acrobatic tenement comparison is very, is, yeah, a very strong one because when I had first heard that before I had heard the other at the drive-in albums, I gave it a fairly positive score, much higher than I have it at now. Uh, but it, it was really like just hearing that album and really connecting with how raw, raucous, and energetic it was, I was really able to get on board with that. And there's definitely a lot of that shared DNA here, although I think as everyone would agree, this is obviously, yeah, much more refined than Acrobatic Tenement is, Mm -hmm. because they did have two albums before that, which I have not gone into, but I would be interested to hear uh kind of to see that that progression like how this becomes your essentially your end product and unfortunately by virtue of time and circumstances Mm. yeah those circumstances having both you know been tragic and deprived us of potentially great music and also benefiting this record um, by foregrounding it as a statement and and bringing and bringing people's attention to it and you know us being here discussing it and discussing its unique and very idiosyncratic joys which you know at their strongest you cannot experience anywhere else yeah 
Um, well, then, favorite tracks and ratings for Brainiac's um, album. Uh, Jake, why don't you lead us off? My three favorite tracks are I Am a Cracked Machine, Vincent Come On Down, and uh, Hot Seat Can't Sit Down. That's uh, also, that, that's just a fucking rager. That song's fucking great. Um, least favorite track, The oh. Vulgar Trade, and I give it a 6.5 cool all right my three favorites on here would be um yeah i'd say uh i am a cracked machine um probably oh boy this is tough i'd like a lot uh probably strung and uh this little piggy least favorite uh also a tough one for me uh i might say uh yeah uh i'd have to agree with uh jake here on his least favorite and i would give it an eight and a half out of ten uh my three favorites are hot seat uh can't sit down uh i'm a cracked machine and vincent come on down I will also say the vulgar trade. Um, really, the only spot on the album that doesn't do a whole lot for me. Uh, and I will also give it an eight out of ten. We're just real original today. Oh. In this section. Hell yeah. Well, shockingly, I'm also giving it an eight out of ten. Uh, my favorite tracks <clears throat> are Vincent Come On Down, uh, Bookkeeper Maxim, Kiss Me. You jacked up jerk. And my least favorite is Indian Poker Part 3. I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. Okay. Uh, my three favorite tracks are Vincent Come On Down, This Little Piggy, and I'm a Cracked Machine. Um, just to be different, I'm going to discount the track shorter than two minutes for, for at least track consideration. So that I don't really care for um, Kiss Me, You Jacked Up Jerk as a song. Um, and I'm giving this record a. Hmm, uh, I'm going to give this record a 7 out of 10. Um, so I would, I'm having a little bit of problem with algorithms at the moment. Um, August has fixed it. Wonderful. Um, so that's a 7.6 average, which is the same as in a previous one. Napalm Death, uh, Deftone, self-titled, both from Genius as well. Uh, the one we did set my heart on fire immediately. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, let us know at home what you think of this record, what Brainiac means to you. If you're a Brainiac fan and you've discovered this video, what do you think of their records? Um, should we check out their other records as well? What else is, is there any other gems in their discography that we should be aware of in particular? Let us know your thoughts on this and Brainiac in general in the comments below. Uh, next week's Record Club episode is going to be Morgan's selection, which is Counterparts' 2019 uh, melodic hardcore record yes. nothing left to love which is sure Lovely. to be banger yeah S but like sad yeah. but like fucking sad banger beautiful yeah. well stick around for that um of course we have uh, released our main episode of new releases for this week as well we reviewed the new backwash record and the new halloween records you can go and check that out as well and on thursday we will be dropping the second installment in our new and ongoing radiohead retrospective on their album the bends so stick around for that as well august do you want to lead us out today sure as always folks rock over london rock on chicago sprite Obey your thirst.